Good afternoon, everyone. I'm George. Um, I um, am a multimedia engineer. I work for Collabora. And today I will be talking about uh, embedded audio policies. Now, <clears throat> let's uh, clear things out first. So what is a policy? Uh, it's a bit of a maybe confusing term because a lot of people hear policy and, and understand it from a security perspective only. So from security perspective, it's what things are allowed or disallowed on a system. Uh, essentially access control. Now, in the uh, context of an audio system, it is still that one part of it is, is access control, but there are more parts to the policy. So um, <clears throat> one part is rules for routing audio streams towards devices. So you have an application, it's playing something, you have to figure out which audio device, which audio output or input it should be connected to. Second, uh, rules for arbitrating between streams. If you have multiple streams simultaneously trying to play something or capture uh, audio from, from an input source, you have to figure out which ones should be doing that and which ones should not, depending on the, on the use case and the context. And finally, rules for configuring those streams and, and devices. So your system boots up and it figures out, oh, you have, there is this sound device here. How should it be configured? Um, what kind of um, sample rate it should be using? What, what number of channels it should have uh, configured? Um, exactly what, what the setup should look like. And the same for application streams. So when application streams comes up, it should also try to uh, negotiate with the application what is the optimal uh, format to, um, to stream that audio out or capture it from the, from the input. So all of that is, is a policy. Now, my title is Embedded Policies. I'm talking about embedded policies. And now what does that really mean? Um, so it's, um, I'm probably abusing a little bit the term embedded because what I'm talking about here is a policy based on use cases. Um, or uh, in some other context, it's also referred, referred as role-based policy. And you will see why later on in this presentation. So it's the typical kind of policy that we have on mobile phones or in vehicle infotainment systems and maybe other kinds of systems. Not every embedded system uses this kind of policy or needs it. Actually, the, more, the smaller embedded systems would not really need that kind of complexity. They usually have one application streaming out to one pair of speakers is enough, not, not needing much else. But when you have a more complex system and you need to have this kind of rules that I mentioned in the previous slide, then you need um, this use case based uh, policy. Now, <clears throat> what is a use case based policy? Let's see the difference between standard one. The standard one that we know from our desktop systems, our laptops, uh, the machines that we work with every day, is that our system has a, has a set of devices. Uh, we have, my laptop has a pair of speakers, it has a microphone, then maybe I'm, I'm wearing headset while, while I'm working. Um, the headset also has speakers, it has a microphone, so these are devices. I can direct my applications to output sound to those devices um, or to capture from those devices. And that's all I care about on my desktop. Now, on a use case based setup, um, I actually care about what is the context of each application. So, if I have a, a, an application playing music, uh, that um, should be associated with the music use case. So, I know that this audio stream here is music content, and that matters for arbitration because if I also have a voice call application that tries to uh, play audio that is basically a communication that I have with a person, then I, at this time I probably don't want to be hearing my music, I want to communicate. So the system should figure this out automatically and stop the music 
um, or lower its vo volume, for example. <coughs> so this is the use case, uh, use case based uh, setup. Now, a use case based policy has basically three components. The first component is how can we associate application streams to use cases? So how can we, um, an application starts, we, we see that there is a, a new stream that wants to place something to the speakers. Um, how is this associated with a use case? The second thing is associating use cases to hardware components. Based on the use case, we may want to route stream differently. Um, in this example here, for example, I had, um, I had the music and the navigation going to speakers and then I had the voice call application going to my Bluetooth headset. Uh, different use case, different device. Maybe or maybe not. Maybe they will end up with the same device. But um, it depends really on the kind of system we're developing and exactly the use cases that we care about. And the third component is arbitrating between use cases. Um, if I have multiple streams going out or capturing from, from the input, uh, what happens? As I said before, if I have some communication going on, I probably want to stop the music at that time. Um, if I have a, a message from, let's say, my navigation application uh, that tells me to turn left at the next uh, intersection or something, at this, I probably want to hear that more loudly than my music. So this is, uh, this is uh, the arbitration component. <clears throat> um, so yeah, streams to use cases, we, we need to, to figure out when we see a new stream, we need to figure out which application is this and what is it trying to do. And associated with, uh, with a use case like music, communication, navigation, and so forth. <clears throat> use case to hardware, which device should we use? Usually there's just one device, but there may be more and we may want to, to have some flexibility there. Um, a much more common use case though for, um, like for routing is, is that we have also a hardware DSP involved. And in this case, uh, the hardware DSP will usually um, expose um, a lot of different uh, outputs for our system. And each output um, is dedicated to a specific use case. That is uh, very common in automotive uh, systems, for example, where you want all the mixing and the routing and uh, arbitration to happen on the hardware DSP. Um, and, and that is also something that our policy on the software side should take care of and should be aware of. Um, there are two ways that a hardware DSP makes itself known to the, to the um, user space. Uh, one way is by having separate syncs for each stream. So let's see an example here. Um, on the top, I have my navigation app that is associated with my navigation use case. And I, the hardware DSP, let's say, for example, here makes a stream available, which is a dedicated ALSA output device. Um, and I know that all my navigation uh, streams are going to always end up to that device and nothing else is going to end up to that device. So the DSP knows that whatever is coming from from that device, basically, um, is, a, is a navigation uh, use case stream. The second way in which um, <coughs> uh, DSPs uh, make streams available to the user space is by having one big device with a lot of channels. And different pairs of channels, if we're talking about stereo streams, different pairs of channels uh, belong to a different use case. So again, at the bottom of this example, I have one device with four channels and the, the, the two front channels, front left and front right, are dedicated to music. So only music should go to those channels. 
and the rear left, rear right channels are dedicated for communication, so only communication uh, audio should go out there. Um, and finally, uh, talking about arbitration. So what is arbitration? Arbitration is basically uh, a yeah, in cases where you have multiple streams going out or, or capturing, you have to decide what happens. So if my navigation instruction is coming while, while my music is playing, maybe uh, one action would be to duck the music volume by a certain percentage so that I can hear my navigation message. Um, or if an important system announcement is, is coming out while a video is playing, I, maybe I want to stop the video and hear the important announcement. It might be a, a, an emergency alert, something that is critical for the user to, 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 to hear at this point and grab his attention, so it should be the only thing that goes out at this point. Now, how is all of that implemented with WirePlumber? What is WirePlumber, first of all? WirePlumber is a session manager for Pipewire. Uh, you can think of a session manager as an orchestrator, basically. It's something that uh, configures everything in Pipewire. <coughs> it is um, suitable for both desktop and embedded use cases. It was actually developed for the use case of automotive Great Linux initially, so it was developed with um, automotive use cases in mind. Uh, a lot of what I'm presenting here actually uh, was developed for automotive grade Linux and later um, we, we developed also a desktop uh, policy and then we tried to merge those two. Initially those two clashed, uh, we tried to find a solution and uh, at this point we've finally come to a solution which is what I, I'm presenting today here. Uh, WirePlumber is heavily, heavily modul modular, uh, everything is, is, is modules um, and you can load and unload anything you like from the configuration file so you can customize it to your system. Uh, all the policy is implemented in Lua scripts, small Lua scripts that are basically event callbacks because WirePlumber is following an event-based architecture. It reacts to things happening to the system, like for example, a new device is plugged or a new application starts streaming. Um, these kind of events are, are the events that the Lua script react to and they uh, take some actions um, that drive this whole uh, policy. Now, the latest version is 0 0.56, released last week. Um, actually, since 0, 0 0.54, we've, we've had this role-based role policy, uh, which is the new, um, uh, it's, the, it's the policy that implements this, this use case-based routing um, and replaces the endpoint-based policy, which was there in previous versions. If you don't know what that endpoint policy uh, is, never mind. <laughs> it's something that was developed um, in the very early versions, uh, considering the automotive use cases in mind. And then uh, as we developed the desktop use cases as well, we uh, realized that these two things didn't really match and, and we decided to, to re rewrite it basically. So all of that is gone. Now, <clears throat> with the role-based um, policy, we can use uh, this uh, use case-based policy in combination with standard policy. So it, it is possible now to have all of that on the desktop as well. Um, and the desktop stuff also on, on automotive or mobile systems. Um, makes life easier, we, we, can, we can do some more, we, ha we have more features, we have more flexibility for testing as well, and all of that. Now, how is this implemented? It's implemented with uh, simple loopbacks, and let me explain further. 
So what are loopbacks in Pipewire? Loopbacks are basically two coupled streams, uh, one input and one output. It's a very simple concept. We also have ALSA loopbacks. We have other kinds of loopbacks. Um, now, in, in Pipewire, we, of course, we don't use ALSA loopbacks. We, we do it internally inside the Pipewire daemon. Um, and we, uh, when you create a loopback, it basically creates two streams. One stream is, a, is an input stream and the other is an output stream. One of those streams will register as a target. Um, that means it has this media class equals audio sync or audio source property. And being a target means that when where Plumber sees an application stream, um, it will have to pick a target to link it to, so that it creates a link and, and makes uh, audio flow from one point to the other, from the stream to the target. So one of those two loopbacks, either the input on, or the output, is going to be a target for streams to link to. The other end is going to be a regular stream. So if I'm talking about um, an output loopback, something that sends audio out, probably the, the, the input part of that loopback is going to be a target. It's going to be an audio sync. Uh, <clears throat> and the other part is going to be a stream output audio. That means it will um, output audio. And we, uh, Wire Plumber will also link it to some other targets, probably an ALSA sync. Now, linking application streams to use cases is as simple as linking the application stream node to the loopback um, input node in the case of an output uh, direction or vice versa in the case of an input direction. Um, <clears throat> this is done by checking the media role property of the application. So the application, this, uh, there is a music application here as an example. You can see that it has a property called media.role equals music. And Wireplumber, when it sees that, it will go and look for uh, target nodes target here means it has the audio sync media class that also has this device intended roles equals music. Uh, intended roles is an array. It can have multiple roles. So um, we can have, let's say, music, video, uh, multimedia as a generic role and other things and redirect all of those use cases to that same um, loopback input if we need to. Um, <clears throat> now, this uh, matching based on the media role is something that exists for many, many years. Actually, Pulse Audio had the same um, thing. Uh, what's different? A different thing here is that in Pipewire, we also have uh, additional, so in Pulse Audio, we relied on the application to report its role. And if you wanted a certain application to have a specific role, basically you, have to, you had to edit the code of that application and make sure that the role was there in the stream. And that's very hard. Uh, it's a particularly hard for browsers, web browsers, web engines. They, they don't have like, a generic use case. Um, they can be used to implement anything. So um, that didn't really work out. Now, in Pipewire, we also have the ability to apply those properties uh, after the stream is created by using rules. And apart from the rules, we also have the scripting capability of Wireplumber, so we can inject uh, additional Lua code to use additional um, rules for deciding uh, which role to pick or which target to pick. So that's what that's the difference with um, Pulse Audio. Now linking use cases to hardware. This is following the standard desktop policy. We let the the other side of the loopbacks, which are streams, to basically link 
to the target that is picked by the standard policy. Uh, um, in the first, so I have a couple of examples here. In the first example, we have a stream that has a media role equals loopback. That media role is not represented in any of the other loopbacks that have device intended roles um, as a property. So if it doesn't match any of those, it will just link to the default um, ALSA sync. Um, and um, yeah, it's not complicated. So second example, we have another stream which has explicit, uh, an explicit target object set. So target object encodes the node name of the target that we want this stream to link to. Uh, this is very, Definitive, it's the, it's the first, um, when we're a plumber evaluate which target to, picks, to, to pick, this is the first rule that applies. If the stream has a target object defined, then it will link to that object if that object exists, of course. Um, so that rule applies here. Uh, third example, we have uh, also a target object, but here we also have additional information to consider linking to specific channels of the ALSA sync. And that is useful for the case where we have a hardware DSP that exposes streams uh, on different channels. So here we say audio position is going to be right, left, right, right. And the stream don't remix equals true property uh, makes sure that Pipewire doesn't reconfigure this stream to have four channels. Because normally, when you have an application and you want to link to an ALSA device, and the ALSA device has, let's say, six channels, and your application is stereo, two channels, it will remix that stereo, it will um, expand it to six channels so that you can hear a surround sound. Uh, but here we don't have a surround sync. It's more like a hacked ALSA sync with two, uh, pair, two, two stereo streams. Um, so we don't want any remixing to happen, and we explicitly say that we want to link to these two channels. Um, simple and easy. Now, how is arbitration implemented? There are two ways to arbitrate, uh, the software way and the hardware DSP-based way. In the software-based arbitration, um, Wireplumber is going to um, consider all the nodes that have the special property policy role-based target equals true as potential um, role-based targets. Um, so it, it will consider them as basically uh, use cases, let's, let's say that. Uh, in, the, in that example here, we had, you see I had this here, but I didn't really mention it. Policy role-based target equals true in that um, music loopback input. Uh, that means that this is a, this is a use case target node. So it will consider all of those as, as use case based um, policy targets and uh, it will uh, use some of the properties that are also configured on these nodes to, um, to assign priorities to these use cases and assign actions. So what happens if I have multiple links going to the same use case or to different use cases, what are the actions? And it has three predefined actions. Mix, cork, and duck. Mix is we let the streams mix. That means we let them play together, no problem. Cork means that the highest priority stream will play and the lower priority streams will stop. And duck means that the highest priority stream will play and all of the others will have their volume lowered to a predefined value. And then we have the hardware DSP-based arbitration. Uh, in that case, no action is taken. We don't have anything going on in Wireplumber because it's meant to be handled by the hardware DSP. And the hardware DSP has its own APIs that are not abstracted in any way uh, on Linux. 
so we cannot do much there, although I'd like to. Um, however, it may be useful in some cases to uh, combine it with software actions. So combine it maybe with the mix and cork actions so that uh, in case we have applications that we need to cork, we need to stop them, we do that in software um, and make sure that these streams don't continue playing um, so that their, their user interface is correctly updated and you can see that they have stopped. Um, let's see that in a, in a graph. So let's say we have two uh, applications. The first one is uh, a music application. The second one is an, a navigation application. Uh, the music application will have the music media role. The other one will have the GPS media role. And we have two loopbacks. Um, one is for music, one is for navigation, so two use cases. And you will see that uh, they have this role-based target equals true. And then they have also some other properties which define the priority of the use case. And what happens if you have um, streams with the same priority, so action same priority means if I have two or more streams that have exactly the same priority number, um, what happens? In that case, I let them mix, so play together. And for the music uh, use case, I also define that I want uh, streams with a lower priority than the music, so lower than 10 here in this example, are also going to mix. And in the navigation use case, I have the same thing. I have a higher priority, and I have also a duck action for the lower priority streams. So that means that with this configuration, if a navigation stream is, starts playing and, and links to that navigation loopback input, uh, the music um, loopback will have its volume lowered, so it will duck. And then we, we have uh, you know, the outputs that go to the ALSA sync and all of that as usual. So, <clears throat> uh, of course, uh, I mean, when where Plumber tries to see which links are uh, eligible for applying this kind of policy, it will have to check that. Um, so, so where Plumber will have to, to basically enumerate all the links that exist. So in this graph, we have four links. We have those two that go from music to music loopback in and navigation from naviga to navigation loopback in. And we also have the two links that go from the loopback outputs to the ALSA sync. So the, the, the ones that go from the outputs to the ALSA sync, they are not considered as part of this policy because the ALSA sync doesn't have the role-based target equals true property. The other two links are considered. So when the arbitration happens, these two links are enumerated and then where Plumber will try to look uh, where they are linked to, what is their target, and then look up the properties of these targets and that way it can figure out what it should do, which action should apply, which one has higher priority, which has lower priority, and which action should apply. In a hardware DSP-based uh, arbitration, as you can see, lots of things going on. There is no um, action, although, as I said, you can combine it with the software-based policy for some actions. Uh, but the idea is this, you have your applications, here I have music, navigation, phone call. They get linked to, um, to the, some loopbacks. The loopbacks are configured to go to specific channels on the ALSA sync. And here you can also see that having the loopbacks in this case is not really necessary because uh, if you have dedicated um, ALSA syncs for each use case, then you could, ha you could put this device.intendedRoles property directly on the ALSA sync and where Plumber will still match. So the phone call up here with the communication role will match to the ALSA sync directly. There is no need to have a loopback. 
the loopback is only useful for two things. One, to implement software-based volume control if you are doing software-based arbitration. Um, you want to have a volume control per use case, which is used also for ducking. So if we duck the volume, we actually modify the software volume control on the loopback directly. And the second uh, reason to have a loopback is to be able to remap uh, multi-channel ALSA nodes to individual use cases. Um, so in this case, we actually needed the loopbacks uh, above to be able to split, um, no, to be able to merge different streams into the four channels of that ALSA sync. Uh, but for the other use case where we had a dedicated ALSA sync, we didn't need the loopback. That is basically it. Now, um, this policy is, um, is now merged, as I said earlier, is merged into wire plumber 054, uh, four, and now we have 056. Um, it works, it works nicely. It is, uh, it is good that we finally have the ability to, to, to to use this kind of policy together with a standard policy. So that improves also how, um, what, what kind of flexibility we have on embedded systems. For example, in automotive grade Linux specifically, um, we also have a software based um, DSP for applying bus and treble um, volume gains. And because it's, it's software-based, we also implement it as a pipewire node, and having that pipewire node also merge with that use case-based policy. Uh, previously, it was a bit of a nightmare. We had a hack to, to make it work. Uh, but now it is perfectly possible because um, we basically um, inserted, insert the DSP node right after the music loopback out and before the ALSA sync, we just insert the DSP node there um, with a system that we call smart filters. That's basically um, a way to automatically configure those filters without um, having to uh, retarget all those uh, loopbacks specifically to go to that um, DSP. Um, and, and it works nicely. So that is the, uh, the advancement. And now next steps, uh, first thing that, that still remains, and it's been there for, for a long, long time, is to improve the corking. Um, unfortunately, when we cork applications, the applications are not properly informed about that action. And that leads to issues with their user interface, uh, where you may be trying to restart playback and it may not be doing anything because it doesn't know that it's not uh, linked. And um, for that, we have actually thought of a design um, and it's a matter of doing the work and implementing it. And the second thing that would be nice, <coughs> but really hard, would be to have all the hardware DSP management directly in Wireplumber. So things like um, abstracting away the volume controls for each stream and being able to, um, to mix and duck and uh, do other kinds of actions that are available with these uh, advanced hardware DSPs uh, directly from the Lua scripting that we have. Um, it's something that would be easy, easy to do with uh, Wireplumber plugins. So we have Wireplumber supports um, plugins written in C that can communicate with any API out there and then uh, expose something to the Lua scripts, expose events, expose APIs, uh, anything that is needed. So that would be interesting. Um, but yeah, that requires collaboration. So if you're interested, talk to me. Other than that, thank you. Um, I'm available for questions. We still have five minutes.
Yes. Is there an advantage of using a prior plumber when we have the DSP? Because it looks to me that it is always only passing the data through. Or... Yeah. Um, so. <clears throat> Well, you need to have, so one advantage here is uh, to have a way to, um, to retarget those streams to specific, you know, also syncs or specific channels. Um, it's something that in, uh, I've seen, I've seen, I've, I've seen existing products, for example, doing that with ALSA loopbacks. They, they create a bunch of ALSA loopbacks. And the problem with ALSA loopbacks is their latency is not that good. They are, they have, they are lacking a little bit in that domain, um, while pipe wire loopbacks are much more, um, much better for that, for that, for doing that. They do that all in software. They have a fixed latency of one cycle, one, one quantum, um, and yeah, it is easier to go that way. Second reason is uh, to be able to uh, have applications behave the same in different environments, so basically abstraction. Uh, if you want the application to be able to behave the same in one system, the other system, or maybe even the desktop, um, it's, uh, it's useful to have these kind of things. And um, <sighs> Yeah, the other advantage is not really there because we don't have an abstraction, but I would, I would love to have also the volume mixer abstracted through that or through some pipe wire API. We could, that could be in pipe wire, basically, to, to have the mixer controls available there. But yeah, these are the advantages. Yes. Um, you mean wire plumber specifically? Yes. Um, it is, so it is used in automotive grade Linux and it is used in some products as well, uh, both automotive and non-automotive. I'm not sure I can specifically name them, <laughs> but yeah, it is used in some products, yeah. Yeah, apart from desktop, of course, desktop, uh, it's, it is the default on desktop, of course. Yeah? Uh, you mentioned um, adding mixers in the software, so um, not doing it in DSP, so uh, could it be possible to use this uh, like in the car with the hardware DSP and maybe using, okay, maybe without DSP using, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it is possible to replace hardware mixers and hardware controls with uh, software-based ones. Um, and it is, it is another advantage that you may have different um, target systems. You may have the same software stack targeting different hardware systems. And it is, um, it, it is something that you can easily switch using if, if you have all the abstractions there, you can switch, easily switch from hardware mixers to software-based mixers. Um, for example, in automotive-grade Linux, um, I don't know if, if, if you were in the previous uh, talk, uh, we kind of have trouble getting hardware and working with hardware, actual hardware. So uh, working with actual automotive hardware is not really uh, doable. And we implement the demo using software mixers. But the idea is that you can have a demo that uses that, and you have all the APIs that talk to it, and then you just remove that as you go into a real hardware, you replace it with a hardware implementation, the, the API stays the same, and you have the same demo working on hardware. That's the idea. Um, of course, it's something that in the future could be reconsidered. I mean, hardware DSPs, uh, could be replaced with software-based ones as, as um, CPU uh, is really there. You can do these things very cheaply. Um, 
So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, integration with sound open firmware would be nice. It's something that I'm I'm uh, looking at as a possibility. Uh, we don't have plans currently, but it's it's definitely something that could be done, and it's interesting to to look at. Yeah. Um, okay. It's um, oh. The, I mean, yes. <laughs> of course. <laughs> I mean, as I said, there are products that actually use it, but they use it minimally and they configure static loopbacks uh, and they don't touch the policy ever. They do all, all the routing statically. Um, and that could be improved that we could have more um, because there are there are actually companies that implement this as i said with static loopbacks static policy where plumber is inactive and they have some other kind of management that decides the pipe wire linking and decides the hardware dsp uh, routing and mixing and ducking and everything so instead of having two components wire plumber sitting idle and something else that tries to take over that could all be combined so that is one other reason I'm I'm doing this. Thanks for your work. Thank you. Thank you for. Okay.